journalist cut off some of my answers and didn't get back to say some of the things I should have said. So I'm frustrated with myself. He asked more questions. He asked questions before I finished my answers. And sometimes I, I resisted that. And sometimes being too sleepy, I forgot to get back to the point he tried to distract me from. I don't know why they do that. What is free software? Free software is software that respects your freedom and your community. So it's free as in freedom. We don't mean gratis. It's not about price at all. Price, if you, if you buy a copy or get one gratis, that's a minor side issue. We're talking about something important here. So to understand the term free software, think of free <coughs> speech, not free beer. And when a program is not free, we call it proprietary software, user subjugating software, because a non-free program creates a system of unjust power, a system of digital colonization that keeps the users divided and helpless. Colonialism practices divide and rule. And that's what we see here. The users are divided because they're forbidden to redistribute copies and they're helpless because <clears throat> they don't have the source codes, they can't change the program, they can't even independently study what it really does. And these programs frequently hide malicious features. But what I've said is rather general. It respects your freedom and community. What does that mean? There are four essential freedoms that define free software. <clears throat> A program is free software if you, the user, have these four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it. So the program does your computing as you wish. And that includes the practical opportunity to use your version in place of the version you got. Freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to make and distribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three, is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute, make and distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. Now, each of these freedoms applies to all areas of life, both commercial and non-commercial, and none of them is obligatory. You're not required to do any of these four things. The point is you should be free to do them when you choose. So, if a program comes with these four freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary software because it imposes an unethical social system on its users. Thus. The distinction between free and proprietary is not a technical distinction. It's not directly about what features the program has. It's not about how the program does its job. It's not about how the code was written. Those are possibly related other issues, but they are not the point. So this distinction is not technical. It's a social, ethical, and political distinction that arises from technology. And therefore, it's more important than any 
mere technical distinction would be. So, <clears throat> the use in society of a free program is development because this free program is knowledge available to the users so they can maintain it, adapt it, extend it, and apply it elsewhere. But the use of a proprietary program in society is not development, it's dependence. It's a social problem which we should try to get rid of. <coughs> to write a free program is a contribution to society. How much? That depends on all the details, of course. But writing a proprietary program is not a contribution, it's a power grab. Because in social terms, this non-free program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. They are meant to attract users to give up their freedom and become users of this program. So those features don't make the program better, they make it more dangerous. Thus, if you have the choice to write a proprietary program or do nothing at all, it's better to do nothing at all because that way you don't do harm to society. Thus, the goal of the free software movement is that all programs be free so that all their users can be free. But what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has its reason. Freedom two, the freedom to help others, to make and redistribute exact copies when you wish, is essential on fundamental <coughs> moral grounds. So you can live an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma, which could happen at any moment. Whenever your good friend says, that program is nice, could I have a copy? In that moment, you'll face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. <coughs> what makes this evil lesser? Well, if you can't avoid wronging somebody or other, it's less wrong to do harm to somebody who deserves it because he has had <laughs> evil. <coughs> we can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. There might be exceptions, but this is the usual the likely case. But by contrast, the developer of this proprietary program will have deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, deliberately tried to isolate you from your community. And that is very bad. So, if you find it impossible to avoid doing wrong to one or the other, do it to the developer. But being the lesser evil does not mean it's good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even when the agreement, as this one, is inherently evil and keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not quite good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's a rather nasty thing. Almost as nasty as an authorized copy <laughs> of that same program. So, when you have fully understood this issue, what should you really do? You should make sure you are never in this dilemma. 
I know two ways. One is don't have any friends. <laughs> That's what the proprietary software developers have in mind for you. Divide and rule. But the other way, my way, is reject that software. Reject proprietary software, specifically software without freedom too. When someone offers me a program on the condition I not share it with you, no matter how attractive it might be, I say, my conscience does not permit me to accept those conditions. Therefore, take your nasty program out of here. That's what you should say also. Don't accept software that's distributed to divide you from your community. And we should also reject the propaganda terms that the proprietary developers employ to demonize the practice of cooperation and sharing. Terms like pirate. When they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They want us to assume that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. But morally speaking, nothing could be more false than that because attacking ships is very bad. But helping other people and sharing is good. So we shouldn't call them by the same name. That's where the propaganda trick is, to use the same name for something good that they wish to attack as we use for something bad. I don't think there have been any pirates around here for hundreds of years. So when people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. <laughs> and when they ask me what I think of music piracy, I say, from what I've read, when pirates attack, they don't do it playing instruments badly and very loud. <laughs> it might work, but instead they use arms. So their piracy is not music piracy, it's just piracy. Well, you get the point. I'm looking for funny ways of pointedly rejecting the propaganda meaning that they use. So, <clears throat> that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you choose. <clears throat> Essential on basic moral grounds. <clears throat> freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason, so you can control your computing, which is something every software user deserves. Now, there are proprietary programs whose licenses restrict even the use of authorized copies. For instance, there is a program, a proprietary program for managing websites whose license <coughs> forbids using it to publish anything that criticizes the developer. <laughs> In this case, Proprietary software literally denies the user freedom of speech. If you can't even freely use your copy, obviously you don't control your computing, so freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code of the program is already set up to do. Which means the developer continues imposing his decisions on you, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but instead through the code itself. So, in order to control your computing, you need freedom one. The freedom to study that source code and change it to make the program do your computing as you wish. That way, you decide rather than letting the developer impose his decisions on you. <coughs> If you don't have freedom one, you can't even tell what that program really does. And 
many of the most commonly used proprietary programs have malicious features. Features designed, for instance, to spy on the user, restrict the user, and even back doors to attack the user. One proprietary package that you may have heard of that does all three is called Microsoft Windows. We know of surveillance features in Windows that send data about the use of the machine to some server. Of course, the users can see the features designed to restrict what they do with the data in their own computers. If a computer is set up so that it won't offer you the chance to do something or refuses when you try, you can see that. But the back, and these features are known as Digital Restrictions Management, DRM, or Digital Handcuffs. The back doors are not so easy to spot, but we know of some. For instance, there's a back door in Windows that allows Microsoft to forcibly install changes without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. This means that Windows is universal malware. It's malware by the same criteria that we would judge viruses. And it's universal because any malicious feature that Windows does not have today could be forcibly <coughs> installed tomorrow. Thus, I describe the, the, a person as the nominal owner of the computer because once Windows has arranged, once Microsoft has arranged for Windows to run in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. So Windows is malware. So is Mac OS because it has digital handcuffs. But the newer Apple products are worse. They have surveillance features. One was discovered a couple of months ago and people started talking about the spy phone. In addition, they have digital handcuffs that pioneer, that go to new heights in restricting the users because Apple has taken control even over the installation of applications. The users are not free to install whatever application they choose. They can only install things approved by Apple. It's not for nothing that people talk about jailbreaking those products. They are jails. And then there's the back door with which Apple can forcibly delete applications. So Apple products are malware. Then there is Flash Player, which has features for surveillance as well as digital handcuffs. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free software. Does it matter that it's gratis? That means that Adobe doesn't require the user to pay to be abused. <coughs> but because of those malicious features, that program is known to be malware. There's also the software in the PlayStation 3, which was designed with digital handcuffs. But it also had, the, it had a feature that allowed people to run any operating system of their choice as a higher level on top of that malicious firmware. And then somebody figured out a way to use the other system to get, to break the digital handcuffs. At that point, Sony attacked all of its customers by forcing each of them to choose between losing one part of the product's functionality or losing another part. Sony offered them a malicious upgrade 
if they installed it, they would lose the ability to run other systems such as GNU plus Linux on the machine. But if they did not install it, they would lose the ability to talk to Sony's network services. Now, uh, this ought to get Sony sued in every country. But then people figured out a way to further break the digital handcuffs in such a way that Sony can never reassemble them. Sony sent the police after those people because they tried to free the public. Because of this, we call for a total boycott of Sony. Don't buy any Sony products. Don't go to their theaters. Then there's the Amazon swindle. Well, the official name is the Kindle, and they call it an ebook reader. But what it really is, is a scheme to eliminate the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash, which is the only way I buy books. I will never identify myself to somebody who's selling me a book because it's my duty to put my finger in Big Brother's eye. It's every citizen's duty. But that's impossible for most well-known books that are not 100 years old with the Kindle because the only place to get them is from Amazon and Amazon requires the users to identify themselves. So Amazon has a gigantic list of all the books that each user has acquired, and such a list should not be tolerated to exist anywhere because it is a threat to human rights. Then there's the freedom to give, lend, or sell the book to someone else. Amazon eliminates this with digital handcuffs, together with contempt for private property, because Amazon says that the user can't really own copy of the book, all the user can get is a license to read under Amazon's imposed conditions. Then there is the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish, read it as many times as you wish, and eventually pass it on to your heirs. Amazon eliminates this with a back door. We can't see the code of that back door. We don't know all the things it can do. We know one thing it can do by observation. It can delete books. We know this because in 2009, people saw Amazon use this to delete thousands of copies of a particular book. Now, these were copies that people had obtained directly from Amazon. Therefore, Amazon knew exactly where they were and knew exactly where to send the commands to delete them. The book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its product was 1984 <laughs> by George Orwell. <clears throat> a book about a totalitarian state which did things such as destroy books that it didn't like. There was a lot of criticism of Amazon for deleting these books, so Amazon promised it would never do this again <coughs> unless ordered to by the state. <laughs> Real comforting. <laughs> Kindle means to start a fire. Evidently, the purpose of this product is to burn our books but it's not going to burn mine because I'm never going to use that or anything like it. So I've just told you about known malicious features in the most widely used <coughs> proprietary software packages. Being the victim of malicious features is not a rare danger 
for users of proprietary software. It's the usual case. And of course we can see why. The developer of a proprietary program has power over the users. And that power is a temptation when the developer is a corporation that's greedy, that professes the philosophy that its highest, that the highest purpose is to get as much money as it can. What will it do with that power? Obviously, it will use that power to get more money. Why would it hold back from putting in any malicious feature that it might get some money with? But with free software, the users have control and the users don't want these features and with free software the users generally get what they want because there's nobody who has the power to force anything else on the users. If there's anything in a free program, if, if there were ever a malicious feature in a free program, the users would have a chance to spot it by studying the source code. They wouldn't have to wait for observation. And if they find a malicious feature, they can remove it. So the users have a defense and also the, the awareness of the developer that he doesn't have power over the users means he doesn't face the same temptation to try to mistreat them. He knows he wouldn't get away with it, so he doesn't get in the habit of thinking, what can I do to shaft my users next? <clears throat> now, I've told you several examples of malicious features, but there are lots of proprietary programs that don't have freedom one, and in most cases we don't know whether they have any malicious features. But since the one who could have put them in is the same one who is stopping the users from checking, we have to suspect them. We have to regard them as potential malware. Each one might or might not be malware. But since the users can't check, they're all potential malware. However, there's something that we do know about each of those programs. <clears throat> their developers were humans. They make mistakes. The code of those programs has bugs. And the user of a program without freedom one is just as helpless against an accidental error as against an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you're a prisoner of that software. We developers of free software are human too. We also make mistakes. The code of our free programs has bugs too, because every non-trivial program has bugs. You just can't avoid it. However, if you find a bug in our free code, or anything in the code you don't like, you're free to change it because we did not make you our prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom one is essential, but it's not enough because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code or do it inside one organization. That's not enough because there are millions of users that don't know how to program. They're not capable of exercising this freedom directly. But even for programmers like me, freedom one is not enough because we're all busy doing various things. And meanwhile, there's so much free software in the world today that no one user is capable of studying all the source code of all the programs she uses, nor personally writing all the changes she might want because that's more work than one human being can do. So the only way we can fully control our computing is by working together, collaborating. And for that we need freedom three, the freedom to contribute to your community, to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. 
With this freedom, if a few users make an improved version of a free program, they can offer you a copy. They can offer everybody copies if they wish. And thus, everybody can have the benefits of those improvements without needing to write them himself. And in particular, those millions of users that don't know how to program can have those improvements too. Without Freedom 3, each of us would be free to write that improvement. But what a waste it would be to have to write it <laughs> millions of times. And the people who don't know how to program would be excluded. So Freedom 3 is essential. And all the users get the benefit of the four freedoms. Any user can exercise Freedom 0 and 2 to run the program as you wish and redistribute exact copies, because these don't require programming. Freedoms 1 and 3 require programming, the freedom to study and change the source code, and then optionally to distribute copies of your version. These involve programming, so any given user is more or less able to exercise these freedoms according to how much she knows how to program. And of course, lots of people don't know how to program and can't exercise these freedoms directly. But when others who are programmers exercise these freedoms and when they publish their modified versions, then every user gets to use them or not <coughs> as he wishes. And thus, all users get the benefit of living in a society where people have these freedoms. Even without directly exercising them, they get the benefit of the fact that they exist. <clears throat> and a user that doesn't know how to program but really wants to change a free program can indirectly take advantage of freedoms one and three. That user doesn't know how to program but can pay someone else to program for him. In fact, he can pay whoever he chooses who's willing to do the job because this is a free market. And if you know how to program, there really aren't any barriers to entry into this market. So let's suppose our user has some money to spend and, and really wants this change made. So he finds a programmer who's worked on that program before and is willing to make it for a price that he accepts. So then they sign a contract. He then gives her a copy of the version he is using, which is exercising his freedom to, to redistribute exact copies. Then she studies the source code and writes the desired changes, exercising her freedom number one on his behalf. Then, when it's working, she gives him a copy, exercising her freedom three on his behalf. And then, assuming it works, he pays her as specified. And a considerable part of the free software business works this way. The four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Every user is free to participate as much or as little as he wishes in society's decision about the future of this program, which is simply the sum total of what the users decide to do with it. By contrast, the proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its owner. Uh, the owner has total and sole control over what that program does. And thus, in social terms, that program just gives the owner power over the users. Because with software, those, there are only two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. If the users have sufficient freedom, then they control the program. And the freedom that they need is the four freedoms that define free software. 
the, those are the freedoms that users need so that they effectively control the computing they do with this program. But if they don't have the requisite freedom, then the program controls the users, and the owner controls the program, and through it controls the users. That's why non-free software sets up a system of unjust power. So society has a choice to make. On one side, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. And on the other hand, the dictatorship of the program's owner. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. And thus, the overall ultimate goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace, including all of its inhabitants. We invite and urge you to free yourself, to escape from proprietary software, and come live with us in the free world that we have built. I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted it to be possible to use a computer and have freedom. That was impossible at the time because the computer won't do anything without an operating system. An operating system is a collection of a lot of programs which together do the usual jobs and provide a base to implement anything else you want to do. All the operating systems for the modern computers in 1983 were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, in order to make it useful, you had to have an, an operating system in it, and that was non-free, and there went your freedom. So how could I change that? I was one man, not famous, outside of the users of the editor Emacs, and without very much money. Few people agreed with me. So I didn't think that an ordinary political movement, such as uh, you know, protesting in the street and uh, sending letters to politicians, would achieve much. And besides, I had no experience doing that. I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But being an operating system developer, that meant there was another way I could achieve the same result. All I had to do was write an operating system, and then, as the author, I could legally make it free software, and then everybody would be able to use their computers in freedom with, by using my system. In other words, I could make a start at eliminating the injustice of proprietary software with technical work in my own field. I was aware of this injustice, which most people didn't recognize as an injustice. I had the skills necessary to start to eliminate this injustice, and it looked like nobody else was going to try if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this work. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning and you know how to swim and there's no one else around and it's not Bush, <laughs> <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save this person. Well, maybe what I have just said is too strong. There might be some other people we could identify about whom I should not affirm a moral duty to save. <laughs> people like Cheney, and Rumsfeld, and Obama, <laughs> and everybody else who supports torture and doesn't respect human rights. But fortunately, I don't need to resolve all these questions because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> However, in the real case in my life, the work that needed doing was not swimming. It was writing lots of code. And that I knew how to do. 
So I decided to develop a free software operating system or die trying. Of old age, that is. <laughs> because at the time, the free software movement had no active enemies. At least half the people I told about it disagreed, but they didn't bother trying to oppose the free software movement. They were sure that developing an operating system was such a big job that we'd never finish it anyway. Now, I also knew it was a big job. I thought that I could get it done. I obviously couldn't be sure. But I realized that failure was not an option. Without a free software operating system, no computer user would ever have freedom. So I decided to develop an operating system that would be entirely free software. I decided to recruit others to help write it so we get it done sooner. I decided to follow the basic design of Unix. Unix was an existing, popular, proprietary operating system with some technical advantages. For instance, it was portable. It could be adapted to new models of computers that were different from old models. Well, I also wanted to make a portable system, so I decided to follow the basic design of Unix. And I also decided to make it compatible with Unix, meaning the same commands, so that all the people who already used Unix would be able to move to my system very easily because they, the things they already knew would work on my system. They wouldn't have to learn anything in order to use it. And then I gave the system a name, which is a joke, because that's the hacker's spirit. No matter how serious something is, you, there's still room for having a joke, uh, because hacking is playful cleverness. <laughs> And that, applied, that could be in any area of life, not just with computers. But in particular, when you're doing some work that's serious, you can still look for ways to put in some humor. So the name of the system is GNU, G-N-U. And it's a joke because it's a recursive acronym. GNU means GNU's not Unix. G-N-U, GNU's not Unix. So the G stands for GNU. Now programmers <laughs> love jokes based on recursion. But why GNU rather than FNU, SNU, UNU? Because those are not words, whereas GNU is a word. In order to be a joke, it has to have another meaning. So GNU has another meaning. It's the name, it's the name of this animal <laughs> that lives in Africa. This is an adorable canoe. <laughs> okay, but it's much better than that because you see, the word gnu is the most humor charged <coughs> word in the English language, used in countless word plays. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So anytime you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U when you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, <laughs> but there are lots of them. So when people see this word, they're already prepared to laugh given a specific meaningful reason to use this as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Please pronounce it GNU with a hard G. If you pronounce it new, you'll get people confused. You see, uh, we've been working on it for 27 years and using it for 19 years so it's not new anymore. <laughs> if you say the new system, you will cause misunderstanding. So please say the GNU system. There's another erroneous pronunciation, which is very important to avoid, which sounds like Linux. <laughs> it is bizarre, but it's true. 
that most of the users of this system pronounce the name Linux, which gives everyone else the wrong idea. You see, well, what happened is that some people made this mistake and other people repeated it. And it spreads faster than we can teach people it's not true. During the 1980s, our work in developing the GNU system was to either find or write all the hundreds of components that we needed for a complete Unix-like operating system. So each component we could either find somewhere else or write. Because our goal was not to have an operating system, each piece of which would be written by us. It was to have an operating system that was entirely free software. And there were various other projects writing programs, some of which would turn out to be useful for us. They didn't have the goal of making a complete free operating system. But whatever goal they had, they might make a program that would do part of this job. And in order to get the whole thing finished sooner, of course, we used whatever free software was available when we could. By 1990, we had almost all the systems but one major essential component was still missing. That's the kernel, which is the program that allocates the computer's resources to the other programs that run. So in 1990, the Free Software Foundation hired a programmer to write a kernel. I chose an advanced, elegant design, which I thought would enable us to save work and would produce something that was an advance compared with Unix. Well, this decision had the effect of turning it into somewhat of a research project. And uh, also, it turns out that the powerful features cause problems that no one realized at the time. And these problems are not caused by errors. They're the, in the inevitable result of the powerful features. And nobody can see how to get rid of the problems, which is sort of sad. But fortunately, it was not a disaster. Because in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had a proprietary kernel called Linux, decided to make it free software. And he released it under the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL and thus made it free software. But why does a free software package have a license at all? Well, it turns out that's the only way to make it free software. Under today's copyright law, which is designed in a way that's quite harmful to society, anything that's written is automatically copyrighted. It's not necessary to do anything to make it copyrighted. That happens automatically. And by default, copyright law forbids copying it, changing it, distributing it, and in many countries even forbids running it. So how can you make anything free software? It takes an explicit formal declaration by the copyright holder giving the users, whoever they may be, the four freedoms. And that statement we call a free software license. So that license is what makes it free software. Without license, it isn't free software. It's just the copyrighted work that people are not allowed to share or change. So free software needs licenses, and any any declaration that adequately gives people the four freedoms qualifies as a free software license. So there are many different free software licenses. I hope you won't write another. I hope you'll use an existing one. And in most cases, the best thing to do is use the GNU general public license. There are, 
There are many other free software licenses. What's special about the GNU GPL is it actively defends freedom for all users. This is known as copyleft. Among the free software licenses, some of them are copyleft licenses and the rest are not. They all give users the four freedoms, but copyleft licenses go further by defending these, these freedoms. And here's what that means. When I started the GNU project, I had already seen a problem where person A released a free program and person B got a copy of it and made changes and distributed a modified version which was proprietary. So the users who got person B's version did not get freedom. For them, it was proprietary software, even though, and even person A's code was proprietary for them because person B had stripped off the freedom. Well, I had seen this, and I realized that if this could happen to GNU, GNU would fail to achieve its purpose, which was the purpose of giving every user freedom. So I needed to find a way to stop this from happening. And copyleft is the method I came up with. Here's how it works. It says, when you redistribute this program, either with or without changes, you must do so under the same license. And you must make the source code available and various other things, all of which have the effect that you must respect the freedom of the next person just as we respected your freedom. When you pass along the code, you have to pass along the freedom. And changing the code is not an excuse to take away the freedom. So if here's my code and you add this piece, there are only two possibilities. Either the whole thing is free or the whole thing is not free. So copyleft says the whole thing has to be free because you can't have any excuse to make our code fail to be free. Every user must get freedom. So copyleft, in effect, makes the four freedoms into inalienable rights of all users. Another way to say it is forbidding is forbidden. Thus, there are free software licenses with copyleft, and there are free software licenses without copyleft. All of them are a way of releasing software such that the users who get your version from you will have freedom. Copyleft does everything possible to make sure all users who get that code will have freedom. When Torvalds re-released Linux under the GNU GPL, it became free software. And the combination of GNU, which was almost complete, plus Linux, the kernel, was a complete free operating system, entirely free software. For the first time, it was possible to buy a PC and run it in freedom. So, the freeing of Linux was an important contribution to the free software community. But the people who combined Linux and the various pieces <coughs> of the GNU system were focusing so much on this one piece Linux that they perceived all the rest of the system as a minor add-on for Linux. So they started talking about the combination, which was basically GNU, as the Linux system. And the people who used this combination mostly imitated them, and by the time I noticed what had happened, <coughs> these people were working on and developing and using a system that was basically a variant of GNU and giving us none of the credit, which is not nice. So please, Give us equal mention. Please call the system GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. It only takes one second to say GNU plus, and it's really important to us 
and not just because we would like to have credit for our work, because credit is not the most important ethical issue in life, and if it were just about that, it wouldn't be so important. But there's something a lot more important at stake here. You see, when people think the system is Linux, they believe mistakenly that it was started by Mr. Torvalds and that he did the main job and that it comes out of his vision of life. And what is his vision of life? Torvalds never agreed with our philosophy of freedom and social solidarity. He rejects it, and he says so. Instead, so he doesn't believe that, uh, that you as users of a program deserve freedom. He rejects that. He doesn't believe that he deserves freedom as the user of a program. He says that he wants powerful, reliable, convenient software. And that's all. And he's prepared to use proprietary software if it's convenient. He's prepared to use, he, he's prepared to develop proprietary software. He refuses to regard this issue as a matter of principle. Well, he has a right to his views. But he doesn't have a right to cite the tremendous job that we did for the sake of freedom as if it were his work and use it as a platform for opposing the idea of freedom, which is the reason we did this work. That's not true. And when he uses that, the credit he's given for our work, the effect is harmful because people who think the system is Linux and that it comes from his vision of life tend to admire him tremendously and adopt his vision of life and they don't learn to value their freedom, which is dangerous for us as well as for them because someday we are going to have to fight for that freedom. Freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you have to de defend it. To see that this is true, it's enough to look at all the harm Bush did to human rights around the world. Harm which Obama does very little to remedy and in some cases makes even worse. Now, in order to defend your freedom, you have to appreciate your freedom. And in order to appreciate your freedom, you have to understand the concept of freedom. In other areas of life, the idea of human rights and the debate about human rights has gone on for decades or centuries. That's time to reach conclusions about what human rights people deserve and spread them around the world. That doesn't mean that we all always succeed in defending human rights, but it provides a base to try, and often we succeed. However, computing is a rather new area of life. Even in the most advanced countries, it's less than 20 years that most people use computing. And in other countries, it's a lot less. That's not a lot of time for the debate about what human rights a person deserves in the use of a program, even if there had been a debate. But the fact is that in general, this debate never got started. Because almost everyone that uses computing started with proprietary software in an environment of other users of proprietary software. And it didn't occur to them that things might be otherwise. Which means that they took for granted that proprietary software was legitimate. Which means, in effect, 
that they allow the proprietary developers to dictate the answer to the question, what human rights do you deserve in using a program? And the answer they dictated was essentially none. They can impose any conditions they like. And the users accepted this without realizing they were entitled to reject it or question it. Most of them. Because some of us are trying to start this debate. Some of us in the free software movement believe we have identified four human rights that the user of a program deserves. And those are the four freedoms that define free software. But when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public and even the users of our system, we encounter two large obstacles. First of all, the users of the GNU system don't know it's the GNU system, they think it's Linux. And they think it was started by Mr. Torvalds and that he was the inspiration for it and it comes out of his vision of life. So, when they see the articles where we explain these ideas, they say to themselves, why should I read that? That's the views of these GNU fanatics, and I'm a Linux user. I'll follow the ideas of Mr. Torvalds, not these radicals. How ironic, because when they say, I'm a Linux user, they're thinking about the GNU system, which is used together with Linux. But they don't realize that. If they knew that the system is GNU, then they might say, hmm, I'm a GNU plus Linux user, and here are the ideas, the philosophical ideas of GNU, and these are why the system exists. I should read this and think about it. And then we'd have a chance to convince them. <coughs> But there's another obstacle, and that is nowadays, most of the people talking about free software, are you changing the tape? Mm -hmm. When did you, when did it stop? Just uh, 30 seconds ago. Well, what was the last thing I had said when it stopped? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not paying attention to that. Well, this is no good. That means you didn't do your job. I can't do it. I don't know when I need to start from. Did it get? Did it get the thing? What we would have a chance? No, it probably probably didn't get. We have a chance to convince him. So okay, I'll start. <laughs> oh, they, they, they were. They didn't realize that they were using the news. Yeah, I guess I will start there. <laughs> if they knew that the system is really GNU plus Linux. Then they would say to themselves, ah, here are the philosophical ideas of GNU, and I'm using the GNU system with Linux, so I better pay attention, and then we would have a chance to convince them. But nowadays there's another obstacle, which is that most of the people, when they talk about our work, they don't even use the term free software. They have another term, which is open source. Now that term was coined in 1998 as a way to, for certain people to distance themselves from the ethical ideas I'm presenting today. During the 1990s, in the free software community, there were two different political camps. There was the camp of the free software movement, people who believe that your freedom is what's at stake here, and we should all demand freedom and work for freedom. And then there were the others who appreciated the same software, who used the GNU slash Linux system, and some of them contributed to development as well, but they rejected viewing the issue as a matter of freedom. These are people like Torvalds, for instance. And there was a debate between these two camps. But in 1998, the people in the other camp created <laughs> that new term, open source. And since it had not been used before, they were able to choose which ideas to associate with it and which ideas to leave out. 
they chose to leave out the entire ethical foundation of the issue and to appeal only to practical values. So they say that they recommend a development model, which is, and, and they recommend it saying that it is likely to produce code of better technical quality. And maybe that's true, and if so, it's a nice bonus. But it's not as important as respecting our freedom, because that's absolutely essential. So they only talk about secondary things. They were the majority of the community in 1998. But even more devastating, there were already companies involved with free software in 1998. And these companies distributed and developed free software, but they mostly also had proprietary software products. And they therefore did not want to teach the community, to teach the users to demand freedom because then they wouldn't be potential future customers for proprietary software products. So those companies chose to say open source and avoid raising the issue. And most of the politicians and journalists follow the money, follow the companies, and since then, most discussion of our work doesn't mention free software or freedom. Which means it does the movement no good at all. So we have to work hard to enable other people to find out about the movement and hear what we think so they can consider whether to agree with us. And that's why I'm giving this speech. That's why I spend most of my time traveling around giving speeches. This work needs to be done. And you can help do it. You can learn to give speeches too. I had to learn. You can learn. But if you don't want to contribute with that much of your time, there are other ways you can help. Simply calling the system GNU plus Linux and <coughs> saying, Free or the appropriate translation, which I had so fiat, which is what did you say? No, yeah. Which is because it's about freedom, and if you can make that clearer in a different language from English, good. Uh, take advantage of that. So um, it's funny. Something's bothering me about my glasses today. It, Feel like they're not quite in the right place, so I keep feeling like I should adjust them, but I can't tell which way to adjust them so that it feels right. Um, and you'll find lots of writing about free software which calls it open source. If you respond by saying this is an issue of freedom and you didn't talk about that, that's very useful. For instance, I see every so often an article that calls me the father of open source. <laughs> I send a letter to the editor saying if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived using artificial insemination, <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. And then I continue by explaining what the free software movement stands for and saying that's what I'm really the father of, that's why we developed the GNU system, and that's what's really at stake here. Of course, I do this because I want the readers of that periodical to see these ideas, which were not in the article itself. And I start with a joke, hoping that that way the letter will get printed. So this is constant work, and we need your help in doing it. Because it's really easy to lose your freedom, especially if you don't value freedom. Our future depends, above all, on what we value. 
if we value our freedom, we can work to defend it and we may succeed. But if we don't think about freedom, we could lose it without paying attention. And this has happened in our community. We don't have to look as far as Bush to see that this can happen. For instance, in 1992, with the liberation of Linux, we got the GNU plus Linux system. You could install a <coughs> new PC and use it in freedom. But it wasn't easy. At that time, you had to be a real wizard. So people started working to make installation easier. They developed various distributions of GNU plus Linux designed to facilitate installation. And these distributions were in competition. Then the developers of a distribution had the idea they could gain in the competition by introducing some non-free programs in their distro and presenting them as advantages. And that worked because most of the users didn't appreciate freedom. They looked at those non-free programs, and instead of thinking, uh-oh, this doesn't respect my freedom, I don't dare use this one, what good is it? They said, oh, how nice, it has this feature and this feature. Of course, they put in non-free programs to do specific things that we didn't have free software for yet. And then they said, our version can do these things. And they didn't say, our version doesn't respect your freedom. They were both true, but they only said one. So they gained more success. Then the developers of the other distros looked at that and said, uh-oh, they're gaining with those non-free programs. We have to put in non-free programs too, and then we'll get rid of their advantage. So over the following few years, they did that. 10 years ago, when people asked me, where can I get a copy of the system? I said, I'm sorry to say that there are dozens of distributions, but not one single distribution without proprietary software. So I don't know any place I can recommend. In other words, we had reached freedom and then we had fallen back because most of us didn't care enough about freedom to hold on to it. Some of us did, of course, but we weren't enough to lead the community towards freedom. Well, I'm happy to say that nowadays there are some totally free software GNU slash Linux distributions. For instance, there is Ututo, U-T-U-T-O. And there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG, Linux, and GNU. And there is GNUsense, <laughs> which is another joke. You see, <laughs> my title as the head of the GNU project is the chief GNUsense. <laughs> Spelled as G followed by nuisance. <laughs> However, the distro name GNUsense is written differently. It's spelled G New Sense. <laughs> so it's a joke. Uh, and there are a few more as well. But you can tell these are not the well known distros that you've probably heard of. The very popular distros continue to contain <coughs> non free programs. <coughs> In other words, we have just, we have begun to recover the freedom that we had lost, but only begun. There's a long way to go to get back to that point where installing GNU slash Linux is installing only free software. And then we lost our freedom in another way. Nowadays, the source code of Linux, the kernel, is not all free software. It's not all source code. Some of it is bogus source code. In some source files, you'll find a long list of numbers. Well, those lists of numbers are really executable programs disguised as source code. 
And these are big lists. There could be up to 300,000 numbers in a list. Well, these are actually firmware programs that were only released in executable form. The source code's not available. And if the source code is not available, it's not free software. And in addition, many of them carry explicit non-free licenses making them non-free software. What happened here? Torvalds doesn't believe that the users deserve freedom. However, for a certain period of time, for reasons of his own, he decided to maintain Linux as free software. And then after that, still for reasons of his own, he decided to put in these non-free programs. In effect, our freedom depended on somebody who didn't care about freedom. And that made it precarious. So nowadays, we need to remove those non-free pieces from Linux in order to make a completely free GNU slash Linux distro. And thus, we have a version of Linux called Linux Libre, which is, a, it's just Linux, just the kernel. It's not an entire system, but it's a version of Linux that doesn't have the blobs and therefore is entirely free software. Making it is easy. There's a, there are scripts that delete the blobs. So the result is something that's ethical because it doesn't have non-free software. Well, this does not, however, give us free replacements for those blobs. So there are certain peripherals that won't run without those blobs, and they won't run with Linux Libre. But we would rather have a program that is ethical than a program that does more and tramples our freedom. And as for those peripherals, well, we just can't use them. It's a fact that there is no, if a certain peripheral won't run without a non-free program, and if you want to live in freedom, you can't use that peripheral, period. There's, to use it, you'd have to give up your freedom. Now, in the long term, you could write a free program to use it with, but the immediate options are lose your freedom or don't use that peripheral. We who really care about freedom, we don't use that peripheral. We get something else. We do it some other way because freedom is worth a sacrifice. People who say they like freedom but that they can't afford to make any sacrifice for it, they obviously don't appreciate their freedom very much. But in the free software movement, we appreciate freedom and we regularly make these sacrifices. Fortunately, they're small sacrifices, a matter of some inconvenience, or maybe buying another peripheral. Which is why, if you look at fsf.org in the resources section, you can find lists of peripherals that work with entirely free software. And those are the peripherals that you need to aim for. So this tells you how, to, how you can correct those problems by choosing the devices that will respect your freedom. So I could give you more examples of how we lost our freedom in the free software community, but this is enough. People who have freedom but don't appreciate it, they can let it slip through their fingers because they don't know that they need to close their hand. So if we want to establish lasting freedom, it's not enough just to write free software and give it to people. We need to teach people to value freedom and demand freedom and defend it. 
And that's something we need your help in. It's now possible to run a non-free program that you didn't even know was in your computer. Many web pages contain software, typically written in JavaScript. And if you don't deactivate JavaScript and you visit one of those pages, it will load a non-free program into your computer and run it. So I turn off JavaScript when I browse. And there are some sites that won't work, or I, some will work, but I have to try hard to find a way to get somewhere. Well, it's one of those things I lose for my freedom. We need to organize so that we can put pressure on these sites to fix those problems. <coughs> Now, there is also a way to lose control of your computing without running any non-free software yourself. And that is if your computing is done by software that someone else is running. This is known as software as a service. The idea is the user, instead of doing her computing in her own computer with her choice of software, which I hope is free software so she can control the computing, instead she sends all the pertinent data to somebody else's server and her computing gets done there by software that she can't see or touch. And then the server sends her the result or takes action on her behalf. And since the copies of software that are doing this work belong to someone else, she, the user, has no control over them. So software as a service is another way to lose control of your computing. You can lose it by running non-free software yourself, and you can lose it by letting somebody else run you don't know what to do your computing. In either way, the result is the same. Someone else controls your computing and you don't. However, software as a service is even worse. I've mentioned how some programs have spy features that send data about the use of the machine to somebody's server. Specific pieces of code written to do that. Well, with software as a service, the user has to send data, all the relevant data, to the server. There's no special piece of code involved, but the result is the same. That user's data is in a server, and who knows what it's going to do then. <clears throat> but it's even worse. I've explained that some programs, such as Windows, have back doors that allow someone to remotely install changes in the software and thus change how the user's computing gets done. Well, with software as a service, the server operator can always install different software in the server and thus change how the user's computing gets done. So using software as a service is the inherent equivalent of using a non-free program with spyware features and a universal malware backdoor. So you better watch out and not do it. That's why we have these buttons that say, don't SAS me. SAS is software as a service. Now, fortunately, software as a service is fairly unusual. Almost all the websites in the world just publish information. They aren't doing your computing, so they're not sets. But if we look at the ones that are, that are non-trivial services, most of those services are not doing your computing. Most of them are communication. <coughs> 
or publishing things for you, or collaborative projects. Well, again, those are not doing your computing, so they're not SAS. So there are only a small fraction that are SAS. But some of them are important, and you need to think about the issue, therefore. For instance, Google Docs is SAS. Google Translate is SAS. So those are examples of the things you've got to watch out for. Now, to finish, I would like to cover two specific points. First, free software and government. Government agencies must use 